Welcome. This week we're going to go over lessons 37 through 40. So how did it go introducing the corner cards with your children? I hope it went well. We're going to spend the next two lessons working on that so you could actually start playing corners. And then we're going to get to play around with the balance and the whole part circles. So let's find out what manipulatives you'll need this week. You'll need the corner cards, the abacus, your math card game book, along with the basic number card deck, the math journal, the balance, the worksheet, and a dry erase board. Lesson 37 is the corners exercise with scoring. So this week, you're going to help your children actually start to score for the game. You're gonna need those four cards that you used in lesson 36. We're gonna use these also in 37. So I hope you kept them separated. If not, they're in your book. You can look for them and grab them out of the pile of corner cards. So using the example in the book, it says to join the cards like this. So we're gonna put our four and one together are eight and two. Let me do it this way so it looks more like what's in the book. Our four and one, our eight and two, and then our seven and three. What do you notice when you're looking at these cards? Some cards are right side up, some cards are upside down. That is how you play the game. And children will adapt to seeing the cards upside down but it might be a little bit of a struggle at first. We match the colors together, and remember they have to equal 5, 10, 15, or 20. You're gonna ask your child what numbers you're gonna to have to add together. Well, it's gonna be the two cards. That equals 5, 10, and 10. Is that something that your child can do in their head? And maybe you need to direct them. Maybe they can't start with a five. Maybe you need to have them start with a 10. Well, what's 10 and 10? It's two 10, and then five more. So there's a couple different ways or maybe they know that 10 and 5 is 15 and then 10 more is 25. Some children may need to do this on their abacus. That is okay. I always find it's better to start with the bigger number. So we enter our 10, our 10, and 5. So they can see it's 25. So here's another way for you to arrange the cards and we want the children to add these numbers together. There's a couple different ways they could do this. We have 10 and 10, which is 20 or 210. We have another 10, so 310. We have 15. That might be a little hard for some kids to add 15 to 310. So let's get the abacus out. All right, so if we're going to add this on the abacus, we'll start with the two tens. Our nine and one make 10. Then we have 15. We want them to use both fingers to move the 15 over. They can see that they have 4, 10, 5, or 45. All right, well, what if we add this in a different order? Maybe we come across this way. We say two tens, 15, and we have 10. So we could do it this way because 5 and 5 make 10. 45, or we could do it this way for 45. And ask the child, does one way seem easier to, than the other? you know, or to try it mentally. Is it easier to add your 10s and then your 15? Um, you know, each child is probably gonna have a different answer, but the majority are probably gonna say yes. So the game at the end of this lesson is found in the math card game book in his corners exercise. And there's a lot of information in your game book, so you're going to want to look ahead at it. Now, one of the things that I did with my granddaughter is I let her use the list that we made the day when we were partitioning 5, 10, and 15, if she needed to use that to help her in her scoring. 
Now they are allowed to use their abacus if they need to use their abacus with their scoring. What I find with playing the games and children are using, say, the chart on the different ways to add 5, 10, 15, or they're using their abacus. The more they play the game, the less they're going to be using those tools. I look at it as like I cook or I bake and um, I use a recipe. And if it's a really good recipe, I'll make it again and I'll make it again. I didn't start off thinking, oh, I better memorize this recipe so I can make it. No, I used the recipe, printed it off, I follow it, boom, good. Everybody loves it, make it again. Well, after a while, guess what? I don't need to refer to my recipe. Or if I do, it's just occasionally because maybe I might have forgot one or two different things, but not all of it. And eventually, over time, I have memorized that recipe. Not only that, I can give that recipe verbally to somebody else without having to look, or I get so confident with that recipe, I feel like I could start tweaking it and doing different things with it. So, you know, I see games the same way. You, the kids play these games, and the more they play them, the less they're going to need those tools. And you'll see that when they start getting it, you'll see that mastery taking shape. Another thing about playing this game is they're not going to link all the cards together. They're just going to take four cards and see what they can fit together, which ones they can get to match. So there is something I do want to point out that's on the back side of the instructions in the game book that says note, and it says a few children do experience great difficulty in reading numbers upside down. And so for these players, ignore the colors and join the cards right side up. If you are making cards, if you need to, depending on your children, make these cards using two colors, the same color is on the top and the bottom, and then your other color would be like your horizontal number. And then it goes on to say how when two people will play, you sit on the same side of the table. When three people play, maybe an older person who doesn't mind reading the numbers upside down will play on the other side. And remember, if you do make some cards yourself, the nine should have a little line under it. The in conclusion, that question, just look at it. And not all children are going to know what the answer is to this. You may want to let them have some time, maybe at the end of the lesson, say, I'm going to ask you a question. You don't have to answer it now. I want you to think about it. But when you think you know the answer, come back and tell me. Now, don't forget about this question. You may let your child just run off and go play and then come back with you later with the answer. You may have to remind them, hey, one, let's come back and let's see. Did you figure it out? And there's some instructions to the right in the teacher's explanation that gives you a way to lead them to figuring out the correct answer. All right, lesson 38. We are actually going to get to play the game today. Your child and you are going to get to play the game of corners. And this is a little bit modified compared to the actual corners just because it's new and your child is brand new to playing this. So it's going to be really, really basic but that's a good thing. For this game, because it's basic, you're gonna ignore the corners. Meaning, say you put cards together, this open area here, that would be a corner. And in a real game of corners, that's like a real prize to, to be able to put a card there. In this basic version, we're not gonna make a big deal about it. We're not going to try to find cards to fit because this is we're just really new at this. And it, it might take a long time if you do it that way. The other way that will make this game go a little bit quicker also is you play on the last card played. Now, I didn't know that when I started playing this with my boys and we would just play on whatever card we wanted. That takes for a long game because when you have 20 cards out there and your child's trying to figure out which one's gonna give them the best score, ooh, it could be long. However, when you play on the last card played, it goes quicker. And the other thing you need to know is if you can't play a card that equals 5, 10, 15, or 20, 
you'll see on the second page, that last diagram, if you look at the very top, it's showing two ones next to each other. So the person who played this card could not play a card that would equal 5, 10, 15, 20. So what you can do is you can play two cards together, like two ones or two twos or two threes or two eights, but you do not get any points for that, zero points. You just are able to play a card. And then the scoring for this game is cumulative scoring. And I will use my marker board to explain. So let's just say you make the first score and it's 10. So you'll put 10 down. You play it next time. Well, the next time I got 15. I'm not going to write 15 down. I'm going to add 10 and 15 mentally. So if I have 10 and 15, so I have a 10 and 10, that's 20 and 5, so it's 25. Then I'm going to write down that score. And maybe the next time I play down a card, I, I get five points. So I would put down a 30. And maybe I get a 20. So it would be 50. So you're writing the answer down and you're just it's a cumulative. Don't, don't know, there's no need to have to cross out these numbers. They just put the new number underneath. And then in this game, the first person to make it to 100 is the winner. I realized I missed something. When you play, like if you play a one and a one together, those colors need to match. You could play a two red, a red two and a red another red two, or you could play a red six and another red six, but you can't play a black six and a green six. It has to be two colors that match and the numbers have to match. But remember, zero points for those. Lesson 39 is solving combined problems. This is one of those lessons we start off right with the worksheet. The worksheet's gonna have the part whole circle sets in it. However, you may wanna have one of these available your child may feel more comfortable writing on here first and then putting the answers into the book. But if not, they don't have to do this. They can just go straight to their book and use their eraser if they make a mistake. Now, be careful of teaching your children to look for keywords because it doesn't always work. And the problem with doing that is children are going to then just skim through and look for those key words and then go and find the numbers and perform whatever arithmetic function they need to do and maybe they're not even understanding what the question is asking. Example is the word altogether. Altogether a lot of people associate with addition and if you look on of charts that have different key words, you know, that show like if you see this word, you're going to add, if you see this word, you're subtract, or if you see this word, you'll divide. Thing with all together is it can be a multiplication problem, but it's not always listed under multiplication. And usually kids are taught that that means all together is an adding. So resist the urge to pull out and point out those keywords. Let your children get comfortable reading and then understanding using common sense and reading to, to comprehend what's actually being written without needing to find those keywords. As it says on the side, it's critically important for children to think through a problem. We want them to think through the problem, not attempt to memorize any pattern or a key word by rote. Now, if a child's struggling, you can come in and guide them, but don't don't make a big deal about any don't make a big deal about any specific words. So here's an example. 
Levi has six apples and nine green apples to sell. How many apples does Levi have to sell? We could have put in there, how many apples does Levi have altogether to sell? But it was kept out because that's not what we want the kids to focus on. Let's think about this. Levi has six red apples and he has nine green apples to sell. What is he going to sell? You could ask your child that if, if they don't understand what they're supposed to do here. Well, he's going to sell his apples. Well, what apples are is he selling? Well, he's going to sell his red apples and his green apples. Well, then how many apples does he have? So is that your part or is one of those numbers your whole? So you see the difference between leading and asking questions to get them to think through the process versus just telling them what they are to do. Resist the urge to tell them. Guide and lead them. Also, if you have a child who struggles with their reading still, fine, read it to them. Don't emphasize any words, just read it plain through. And then let the child think about it. If a child still doesn't understand it, then read it through another time. And then you can ask some questions. And for the game, they get to play corners again. Fine, fun game. Last lesson for this week. Lesson 40, sums to 11. We get to use the balance today. Yay, I love the balance. It's one of my favorite tools. We get to work with the balance. And of course, you want to make sure it's balanced before you put your weights on. If you need to, you can move these little white things. They're, you move them left or right to get it to balance if you have to. All right, so it starts by saying, let's put a weight on the 10 and on the two. Now you're gonna ask your child what is needed. What do we need to make it balance? Well, by now they know that eight plus two equals 10. So then what is our equation? Our equation is 10 equals two plus eight. Now it says to place another weight at the left one, and we're going to ask, where does the weight on the eight need to move to make it balance? Let them think for a minute. Hmm, that doesn't work. I get it right. It balances. So we have 11, 10 and 1 make 11 equals 2 plus 9. So in partitioning 11 on the abacus, just take some time to look over the figures that were drawn. This is one of those things, there's two different ways of doing this. You're going to show your child both ways and then use the way that they feel most comfortable with, the one they understand the most. That's the beauty of getting to show them a variety of ways. It's because you never know which one's going to click with them. The lesson ends with a game called Go to the Dump with 11s. You don't want to play this game with your child if your child is not strong on the facts that equal 10. So like if they still struggle with 7 and 3 make 10 or 9 and 1 make 10, don't play this game yet. There's an alternative game that's listed in the, in the side for the teachers. You could try that out. So if your child is good with making the facts that equal 10, then you're gonna play this game. And here's an example. So I have a hand of, now, so you have a child, they have to make facts that equal 11. Now they could they use their abacus. But this is kind of how I played it with my granddaughter. So she knows, let's say she has a six, what fact equals 11? Well, I ask her, six and what equal 10? Well, six and four. So then six and what would equal 11? Because she's been learning that that's one more. So she'll know, well, if I have a four, then oh, I'll need a five. Oh, grandma, do you have a five? And I either give it to her if I have it. She lays it down because six and five make 11. 
or she goes to the dump. Same thing, any of these cards. Let's say she picks the eight. And I'll remind her, eight and what make 10? Well, eight and two. So well, if eight and two make 10, then eight and what would make 11? Oh, eight and three. Ah, I have eight and three. I get to lay those down. So it's a fun game. Just might have to remind them at first to think about what numbers make 10 so they'll know what number they need to make 11 and know what number to ask for. All right, we are done for another week. <sighs> Big breath. This is a fun week because now you know how to play quarters. It's an enjoyable game. It's fun for the whole family. Well, at least those that know how to add up to 5, 10, 15, or 20. So have some fun and get dad in there. Get, get some family members in there. Show off your child's skill in adding mentally. So hope you all have a great week. Enjoy those kiddos. Enjoy your time homeschooling them. And I will see you next week as we go over lessons 41 to 44. Until then.